Hello, I am Kevin Smith. I will be interviewing Dwayne and Val, who were with the ISSS International Secret Service Supervision. They will be finally telling their stories after over 50 years of keeping quiet in this ongoing new series as they are both here to help save this planet Earth. First, I will give a brief background as to my relationship with Dwayne and Val as Kevin the Great Witness. After many millions of lifetimes, would I come into this current one, as I, like all individuals throughout creation, ultimately seek to recognise the true reality, the isness, real awareness, that we all are. For this is the real purpose, and all individuals decide when they will begin this process of awareness, of recognising their real awareness from their personal created self, and then recognising the isness that they are from the comparison that creation and all its experience affords, comparing that which isn't real creation to that which is this a true reality. And so, for me, my decision to wake up to this true reality would be so in this lifetime, and very likely I have attempted this before. But regardless, as my real awareness so decided this lifetime, so would references that pertain to the ears enter my experience. In this lifetime and current moment in cause and effect human experience on planet Earth, the opportunity can be found in the form of Dwayne Hepner, who had the recognition of the ears, and would agree to present it to humanity at this time, creating his new presentation, which through what is provided, can one have all the references available, a blueprint for a process that will take them inexorably to a universal position of is standing and being, if they so choose, have the focus and real intent to do so. And so, I would come to find the new presentation. I would come to find Dwayne. This would have been November 2017, and my journey would begin, my process of awareness, and it continues on, as I too share and present the ease, revealing that which I have been shown by the real guides on the real side, that others can also benefit and become more aware also. And now, secrets of the real secret service exposed, with Dwayne the Great Writer and Dean Val. Yes, we are here, we showed up. Yes, and we made it, didn't we, Val? We sure did. Yes, we, we made it this far. It's very interesting that we have, uh, every day I wake up, it's like, oh, I'm still here. So, uh, but uh, have a lot to do. 
So I'm going to start out here a little bit, then Val will come in and we'll go back and forth. Um, a little background on me, and that is we're going to start before this lifetime. And I wrote about that in book one, which is from then till now, which was a previous lifetime. And then in between lives, this was all set up. This was the next step here to where Paul would come in first and do his presentation. And then I would follow up uh, with what I call the true completeness, uh, the new presentation, etc., providing uh, what no one else can hear about the real awareness each individual is more so than just you are soul or you know you can pop out of your body and have far out experiences and chase thrills on earth and other places but uh, that's a lot of fun but there's a lot more to it and so as i grew up and i share this in book two uh, journey to real freedom uh, it's a fun little story that uh, uh, i written. It took me uh, about nine, ten months to write the first one uh, in 2003, and then by 2005 I had it published. And so I, I was, uh, I came into this life in, uh, in the state of St. Paul, Minnesota, and my mother eventually moved to the beach, which I love the ocean because I could see it from the real side too. And as I grew up, Many experiences with uh, Rivasar and the real guides uh, rehearsing me for this, which I didn't, you know, here's a new body and a new mind and didn't know what was really going on. I was just going through the experiences and eventually into the teens where I started surfing at about 14. I really liked that and got to the point in the 11th grade where I could no longer tolerate school and quit. Uh, more than happy to do that, and then started to go on my adventures at about 17. And so uh, I went to Hawaii and then down into Mexico, and uh, we were surfing down there and approached by some uh, federal agents that uh, wanted to hire us to do certain surveillance and actually spying on uh, certain people down there that were doing um, certain things. I'll just say that. I'm not going to really get into it. But so we did that for a while. And from that, my my dad was already uh, in the Marines and Secret Service, which I didn't know. And I hadn't seen him for years since I was about 13. So this... Um, this became very interesting. They paid us cash. It was uh, a lot of fun. Uh, I did it for about a year, year and a half or so down there uh, and surfed those different spots down there in Mexico. It was uh, down there near Acapulco and below that, etc. And then some places above up into Mazatlan and San Blas, etc. Moved around different areas and they would give us assignments. They were kind of easy. It was just surveillance and we'd report back to them. But my dad got wind of this at some point. They uh, they contacted my dad, and so I was talking to my dad, and he said, "Well, if you're if you like doing these things, I have something very very interesting to talk to you about and show you." And so one thing led to another, and uh, eventually, uh, and I was shown on the real side too how this is set up, and there is a connection with the real guides and certain areas of the secret, secret service, et cetera, more so than just the guys that are the people that uh, secret service agents that uh, protect the president and politicians, et cetera. That's uh, something there, but this wasn't really it. And uh, there, uh, we didn't have any weapons or anything like that. It wasn't that. I was because I could see certain things, etc. So I got into their, I touched base with some of their programs, their Montauk, their mind control programs, uh, time travel, space travel, etc. They have all UFO technology. Uh, they travel to other planets, been there, done that. It's not really that interesting. Uh, met many aliens, etc. Uh, but I like the surveillance part, and I like the part about how I was shown on the real side how this was all being put together for the future, which I still didn't really 
understand. I was just kind of going through it because I liked the adventure of it. It was fun. And it was something daring. And uh, as a surfer, hey, I was for it. I was out of high school. I was doing fine, et cetera. And at the same time, I also eventually got into construction at about 19, was doing my outer personal life because this uh, eventually it, it became the uh, International Secret Super Supervision, which even the politicians and even the Secret Service, a lot of them do not know about or the military, etc., because it is multidimensional. And some of them understand this with the shapeshifters and the aliens and the reptilians. They understand this physical astral, but they really do not know about the real guide. So there's an extension here that's very, very interesting, but you have to have the awareness to be part of it. And so uh, this was very interesting over the years. And as uh, time went along uh, with uh, construction and then finally getting married, uh, also getting into uh, some, I was shown to just, uh, you know, get involved with some psychic paths, some astral projection and things like that. And eventually, uh, Rebazar was showing me what Paul had set up with Ekankar. And also with the uh, Secret Service, I was to be, uh, you know, surveillance with that in a way, too. There was a governmental side to this Secret Service part two that we played with and kind of played along. It's very interesting. If you, you know, if you're interested in knowing more about this, you can watch any Netflix movie. It's all about that because they reveal everything that they do. And so they do a lot better production than I would do, but it's all there. And, um, uh, you know, going through this, I'm amazed myself what I've been through. I'm amazed that I've come to this point here and the world and all of creation knows what we're doing, especially years ago when I was with a couple of seers and we put the Queen of Orion uh, in the Phantom Zone. I call it the Phantom Zone because I used to read Superman comic books. I used to like those, etc. So I'm skipping around here a bit, but we'll go through this as we go. Uh, and sh and give more detail about this because it is a lot of fun and bringing it up to the present time where we're at right here. Now, Val, Val and I met at a uh, seminar, uh, an Ekankar seminar in the 70s, and we were to meet and we went over some things and he had his life, etc. And uh, Neither one of us ever told anyone about this, our wife or children. Nobody ever knew until now that we're really exposing this. So uh, it, it's just time because of what's taking place and all the different factors in the world. So I really like this because I like the adventure, the challenge. And there's always going to be confrontation with this. And I like the confrontation, too. I like the challenge of it. And so, yes, the world is scary, but it doesn't have to be. It's all based upon agreement and what people decide. Well, that's what they agree to. And most people have their own personal consciousness bubble and they can learn to see past that and be OK. But at the same time, we have to deal with it here. So and I like Sheriff Mack's approach because it's a peaceful approach to liberty. Doesn't mean that there's going to be liberty here, but at least it's something we do something share something because that's how each of us become more aware. When Paul was here and created Ekankar, Paul was the babysitter. And those people that are still emotionally attached to that, I wrote a group called Pizza Dough. That's exactly what they are because I saw them. They're all pizza dough. They need to get out of themselves and their own self-made bubbles. Everybody does take the risk, step up, share the real guides, Rebazar and the real guides that are here and learn to recognize the isness. It's no more levels or any of that. Like the sun shining, recognize the sincerity that real life is aside from those five personal bodies. Yes, and there's a lot more to that. So I'll, uh, I'll give it back to Kevin here and he can say something to Val. Go ahead. Okay, so we'll pass it over to Val then and he can uh, bring us up to date with uh, his involvement in the uh, Secret Services and how we came to find Dwayne and such. Thank you, Kevin. 
Yeah, it didn't really come to light for me until I came into the new presentation in 2014 when I was 64. But I had had a lot of impressions and real side experiences before that that really didn't come come into focus until uh, 2014, I'd say, when when I uh, came into the uh, the group here that Dwayne created. And my background is European. I, I was I came into this life in 1950 post-World War II, and that's going to have a lot to do with my story, because my parents are Latvian, a little country in Northern Europe, uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, the three Baltic states. They were um, escaped from the um, Soviet occupation. I was born actually in Germany in 1950, but my first language is Latvian, and they raised me uh, in that culture. And then I moved to the United States when I was six months old and lived in Michigan, Grand Rapids, Bay City, until I was about five. And then I moved to the West Coast to California, Palo Alto, California. And then I went through the school system and I started a landscape gardening business, um, basically because I, I did have a teaching credential, elementary teaching credential, but the politics was just too horrific for me to, to handle. So I liked outdoors. I, I started my own business and got a gardening route, did some landscaping, and uh, it was all good. And then. Again, through all these times, you know, I have experiences, and uh, a f funny part of this is that my parents pay attention to their dreams. They're both gone now, but they pay attention to their dreams, and they had a guide, which I didn't even know about until later on when I joined Eggencar. but they've had moments in their life when this guide came in their dreams, and Nudge, nudge them to, or hinted to them to do certain things. And when I joined this uh, spiritual path, Eggencar, they saw a picture of Paul Twitchell, and that was the guy that they had been uh, working with. They never joined Eggencar, but they they had a, a connection with Paul, and it made a lot of sense for them because again. They paid attention to their dreams, and Latvians are more or less uh, you know, connected to the nature more than religion, because the country is Lutheran, but they are more, you could say, animists. They, they, they are with nature. They appreciate and have a lot of gratitude for what nature gives them. So, yeah, there's a lot to this. Uh, I think I'll just, and then like Dwayne said, we met in the physical in in the 70s. I joined Eckenkar in the early 70s, and then we got together, and we've been doing certain things in the meantime. But um, no, I look forward to sharing my story with uh, the Secret Service, too, that part of it, as we go along here. So thanks, Kevin. I'll give it back to you. So in your young years, um, did you have uh, any indication of what was to come in regards to the secret, to your secret service involvement specifically prior to when it, prior to when it became so? Did the guides reveal anything to you that hinted towards this? No, at the time when I was young, no, I was just uh, being raised by my mother and just uh, as I have uh, written in book two, uh, you know, I had uh, the real side experiences, but like a kid, I was just going through them and, uh, you know, you have a new body and a new mind here and it's really set up this way so that we don't have the interference 
of what we went through in the past because all of us through all the lifetimes and you especially kevin uh have talked about your past experiences etc and then all of us all of us have gone through uh horrific things and lives and deaths and whatever tortures and struggles uh uh, for lifetimes and uh, you know as we get a new body and a new mind each time uh, we really don't want to see that uh, we really don't want to see all that stuff even though we have it like books on a shelf in our uh, files you might say in our other bodies etc because we do base ourselves off those experiences but we want a chance at a new life where we start over because all creation refers to recognizing the is. That's what it all refers to. Even though people come here, they make a life, they build a house, they, you know, today it's get a job. It wasn't the same in the indigenous days of the Indians and, you know, the Aztecs and whatever. Uh, no, it was surviving with the natural environment that exists here on the earth. But today it's get a job, make money, etc. And it's really kind of funny, I ask, People sometimes, did you come here to get a job? Is that why you came to Earth? You know, and uh, does that make sense? Well, of course it doesn't. We came here to wake up. And so every lifetime, uh, we get a new chance. And so as I was going along, of course, it was being prepared. And uh, the real awareness knew this, but created the personal self. You know, as the experience here to eventually put it all together. So little by little, as I was shown this or that, no, I was just going through um, the experiences uh, and had uh, no idea uh, because they were just, you know, just like a, a mother raising the child. You know, once in a while you talk about the future. But for the most part, you don't. It's always moment by moment and what you're doing. And maybe the kid wants to be a policeman or a fireman someday, etc. Well, I had no real aspirations to really be anything. I look back at uh, look at how I was in the body at that time and the youth. And I really didn't. And when I started surfing at around 14, well, all I want to do is surf. That was it. And so that's all I could see. I wasn't interested in a career or working indoors, et cetera. I really didn't know what I was going to do. I really didn't. It was like I, would, I didn't even consider it. And so little by little, uh, things came to be this and that and whatever. And actually, uh, my mother, who had been married three times, she was with her third husband when I came back from uh, Hawaii and Mexico and all that. All of a sudden, she was with her third husband, who I knew previously, uh, who was very abusive to her. And my mother was an alcoholic, but she was a good person, very good person. But uh, she used to drink with, uh, you know, uh, she'd have boyfriends and she had this one fella that uh, they were very abusive together. But all of a sudden, I come back at about 19 from the trip because I had saved money uh, from other sources. I had it from the uh, Secret Service. I had money uh, saved up. And so uh, he was in he was in construction. And so I kind of looked at that and I thought, oh, that's cool. Uh, you know, uh, I, I like building and doing things. So little by little, uh, I got into construction, etc. And then uh, as as things went along, uh, then met people and eventually uh, met uh, my first wife. Uh, that was, uh, kind of forget now, it was around, around 19, yeah, it was not 1971, actually. It was when Paul had just passed. And this was all set up, too. And uh, speaking with Paul and Rebazar and whatever on the real side, Prior to his passing, uh, he was telling me that uh, it's all set up for me and the next person that's coming through uh, is going to announce you. All right. He's going to be like the caretaker, but he's going to help you in the business world, etc. And that was Darwin Gross. I had seen him on the real side, but I didn't really know him. And there was a meeting 
1971 at the Edgewater Inn in Long Beach at Pacific Coast Highway, uh, where it goes over into Naples and then into Long Beach. It was a, uh, a huge hotel there. And Patty Simpson, who I knew very well that worked with Paul and Helen Beard, they had set up this meeting. And there was just a certain amount of people, probably 20 or 30 invited. And that was the last time physically I saw Paul. We had meetings and Darwin was there, but I really didn't know him at the time. But I'd seen him on the real side, too. And so it was rather set up in a way and the boys could see what he was deciding and going to do. So they let him do it. In other words, uh, as Paul had set up Eckenkar, it's very, very interesting. And most people don't know this, that, uh, you know, uh, there was there's always those there's always infiltrators uh we'll just say from the certain few of the dark brats or the cabal whatever it doesn't matter there were infiltrators into uh, they infiltrate all these groups and paul had done very very well and so it was to get rid of paul uh, which did take place and, and they knew that and it was paul's time to to go uh, he had done his part. It was best that he leave the scene. So it was all really set up for that. And there was another gal that was prompted and uh, part of uh, the reptilian influence, which was Joan Cross, who is uh, Harold Klemp's wife. And uh, at this time, she wasn't at the time. Marjorie was the wife. And I knew Harold and uh, Marjorie uh, when Patty Simpson first created the center first, opened the center, uh, which was in an architect's office in Laguna Beach. Uh, Harold and and Marjorie would come in there sometimes. And Harold lived, uh, I believe it's Northern California. I really didn't follow where he was at, but he, he was first lived in Costa Mesa, Costa Mesa, California, which is right next to Huntington Beach, where I lived. And so, uh, you know, as time went on, well, and it's even recorded on the Internet. Well, Darwin got the board of directors after Paul had passed. Darwin gets the board of directors to give him money on 500000 to buy uh, Paul's copyrights from Gale. And so uh, this just kind of went along with this. And so at the, at the fifth Worldwide Seminar, which was that year, it's in October, it was in Las Vegas, it was set up accordingly because there were board members that had instigated this and were agreeing to the takeover uh, with Darwin, etc. Uh, and so he became the new Living Egg Master, it was the idea. And it was uh, agreed to on the real side that he would announce me because I, I was the child that Paul talked about that would be coming and he didn't say when etc but that was me i was the new kid and so as this went along darwin decided not to do that and so Rebazar all said don't worry about it just go along with it just stay there etc because it's going to take us uh you know many years to set up what's coming up next because it's going to go through all creation etc and so this is the interesting part. And at a certain point, uh, you know, I could see and I was shown that there is something far more than what Paul was presenting. And so I had the awareness to start to recognize it. And that was the isness life is. And Paul had hinted this in the book. Rebazar talked to him about the isness, just a few sentences in, uh, I would say, dialogues and uh, uh, the far country. Those two books right there uh, said a lot, etc. But the dialogues that Rebazar gave at that time were for that time. They were more restriction, more along the lines of religion, etc. This is how Paul had put it together. He put it all together. He put Eckenkar together as an upbeat to what had already existed. He wasn't going to go too far out because he wouldn't have gotten the membership that he did. And he created the membership and all these things along those lines because that's how people saw it at that time. And they felt more comfortable if they 
belong to a membership, they were paying dues, etc., and that they were spiritual and all these things, and the God idea, etc. And eventually, Paul brought in the Sugmod idea, which was rather interesting. I think he just kind of threw something out there to shock people a little bit, etc. But uh, at the time, the charge words and the initiations and everything meant something. Um, I made it up into the seventh initiation, which well, the initiations were real. I was an initiator, etc. But uh, when the rod of power came in 2001, uh, August 3rd, uh, at midnight there, I was, uh, it was really rather interesting with Paul and the real guides, etc., and then I was told to, uh, you know, tell the world, okay, it's you. And so uh, it took me a while to do this because uh, I didn't really know how to do this. Okay, what am I going to say, you know? Uh, so what I did is I first faxed. I had a fax machine at the time. Uh, and I faxed the... Uh, international office and i simply uh, wrote on this piece of paper i said uh, harold is going to announce the uh the new living at master that's all i did and let me back up here a second actually on the real side too uh, i had a meeting with harold i had a meeting with joni and the influence and this is the first thing i was shown when i took the rod of power immediately I was shown the influence. Whoa, that became a new day. All of a sudden, she's standing there staring at me with her dark hair and her, you know, kind of evil eyes and uh, et cetera. And she's a very interesting character. Now, the influence is a combination of all that's, you know, strange in creation. And there's also something behind the influence, which I wrote about in book four, The Adventures of Reba Zartars. Uh, the Supreme Deceptor, who's in the subconscious area, but it's the influence that basically reigns, which is, you might say, the right-hand man, but she's usually feminine, of the Kalim God in the mental worlds. This all becomes very, very interesting. And so there was a meeting on the real side, and I described this in the book, and Harold had walked up to me, and Harold has big ears. Okay, He has big ears like Alfred E. Newman in Mad Magazine. And he pointed to his ears and they were pushed back. And he said, he said, uh, look, I had a, a, a talk with, uh, with the masters. He used the word masters. And uh, they kind of pushed my ears back. In other words, they were screaming at him so much uh, to, uh, you know, uh, really wake up from what he was doing, what he had done with Joni that uh, it pushed his ears back and uh, we shook hands. And I figured at, at that time and that experience, and there was Joni, she was unconscious. She was standing unconscious with the influence, uh, with her arm around her smiling at me. She was all in black, black nylons, high heels, et cetera, a lot of lipstick. She was looking straight at me. It's like, oh, see, I got Joni here. And Joni's the one controlling the show with Harold because Harold was emotionally attached to her. So that was all those years in Ekinkar. We'll we'll go back over that from time to time. But uh, this became a very interesting, uh, very interesting experience for me. So I expected that they were going to call me. That Harold was, oh, he's going to call me and tell me, okay, you're you're the new living egg master because the boys said that. That blah blah blah. And uh, Darwin and Harold took Paul's title. They were just to be caretakers and actually. Uh, Harold was not in the picture except for Joni picked him because she got tired of Darwin. Darwin's very, very arrogant and controlling, and she didn't like that. So she gradually got rid of him, brought in Harold. He was the janitor. I knew Harold very well. He worked up in Menlo Park as the printer. Uh, and there's more stories with this as we go along, etc. But coming into present day more so uh, with all of this, this was my, these were my steps. These were some of my steps and bigger steps to more so and more so 
recognize this reality to prepare myself to create a new presentation and it took me years to figure that out etc so we'll go over this more so and more so as we go along and uh, Kevin uh, did you have another question or did you want to talk to Val I'd like to hear some things from Val too it's interesting and funny sometimes how we're put into certain situations or we agree to them but I was or I had the opportunity with the Secret Service uh, to this is stepping ahead from the background that I'll be giving later but I ended up doing surveillance in the late 60s early 70s for these uh, new so-called spiritual groups and uh, movements coming out and one of them was Agatha Carr and the other two that I was involved in was Scientology and Self-Realization Fellowship. Getting back to Ekankar, I was, like I said, I joined in the early 70s. And I knew Harold. He was one of my teachers in Mountain View. I knew where he lived. I was I went over to his house often. He lived off of Rinkstorf Avenue in Mountain View. He worked in the Menlo Park office there in, in like Dwayne said, printing. I knew his wife, Margie, and their daughter. And part of what I was doing is basically reporting back to a handler. Uh, very kind of nonchalant, just, just uh, nothing really serious. But that was one of the things I was doing was this surveillance on these groups. Now, remember that a lot of these groups are created by the <laughs> government uh, and they sponsor them to see how the people react to certain things, you know, in terms of like social engineering and how uh, it's part of the MKL from mind control program. These groups were, were set up for that purpose and uh, given the drugs and you know seeing how people react to drugs and all that so i was just basically there to uh, see how people reacted and at the same time though i knew that, like the ekankar movement was real at that time it was very real so i was in a funny position where i was both watching them for the government and also uh, gaining experiences and, and you know inside of myself I knew it was was authentic what Paul was was bringing out so drop it there go ahead so Val uh, were you approached in a similar manner then to Dwayne is that a standard procedure that these agencies would approach these individuals they determine do they determine as potentials in that in that manner they'll simply march up to them in a in the, in the street literally well that goes way back to my parents in world war ii and a fellow named elliot roosevelt which is the second son of fdr and eleanor Re roosevelt my parents met him a long time ago in the early 40s when he went to the country of Latvia, to the capital of Riga, and had a meeting with uh, the Soviets regarding TWA, uh, finding a flight, uh, flight pattern or flight uh, situation for TWA because he was an aviator. And they were doing, uh, they had meetings to set up that that um, and then my parents that's where they he met my parents in riga and that's where it all started the connection with at that time it was the oss the office of strategic services um before it became the cia in 1945 but at that time the oss was active in uh, engaging in information gathering etc and and at the same time, Latvia was being uh, was occupied, or uh, the beginning of World War II, uh, Soviet Union occupied it, and so there was a resistance movement, 
and that's where my parents come in and basically they met Elliot there and that's where it all started but we'll get into that later as, as the events move up but that's that's my connection to this uh, secret service and uh, similarly to Dwayne then your what began as surveillance would also introduce you then into similar projects that he described involving time travel space travel aliens and montauk projects etc yeah that's a little beyond me i was basically a, a the guy <laughs> um basically surveillance but uh, uh i was you know in it for the adventure too i mean i like to be in the front lines of what's going on so i was very very open to anything like that and I'm just learning from Dwayne, basically, that part of it, you know, that, that uh, you could say uh, more expansive part of it, because I have had a very elementary, basically, education in, in a spiritual way. But uh, again, I'm more of a physical kind of a guy. So, they, so what happened to me, I gained my experiences physically and then, then it expanded into more what the awareness part and the recognition part. But like I say, the, the, the dreams my parents had, that prompted me a lot. And then I had my own experiences too, to, um, uh, to, you know, to, to carry on with this. And, and I just really enjoy it and love it, the, the adventure part of it. And that's what kept me in it all through these years. So uh, at the time, even though you weren't to be involved in uh, such projects, were you aware or have any indication that such were going on? Uh, regarding which projects? Regarding broadly the uh, projects that involved that which Dwayne mentioned, the space travel, the time travel. Were you aware that these are secret societies that, although you were only in a surveillance capacity, were you aware that there was much more going on and that it possibly did involve um, otherworldly activities, so to speak? Well, as you've probably heard, it's very compartmentalized, all these programs, these secret service programs. One, one thing I did have, there was a meeting in uh, Stanford University, Palo Alto. That's where uh, the university is. That's where I grew up. There was a meeting for the some of the agents but it was regarding health it was very interesting because they're uh, they they uh, briefed us on different health alternative health uh, uh, methods which the public wasn't privy to and some of these were alien alien things but basically oxygen you know and, and uh, the value of that and, and other things that um, the public really wasn't aware of or wasn't marketed to. So we had a meeting in this little house here in, in uh, Palo Alto and, and we had other meetings too regarding that. But the, the time travel, no, I didn't really, wasn't aware of that. Actually, I wasn't even aware of uh, a lot of things, so-called conspiracy, uh, you know, the, Federal Reserve Act and uh, chemtrails until later on. Like I say, it's compartmentalized. So I was basically just doing the surveillance. And until I found Ekankar and then the new presentation uh, became more, more aware of what was going on. Yeah, so Val, if you if you had remained with the secret services doing their surveillance do you imagine that you may have moved into uh, other more um overt operations that such which Dwayne described i mean would it work in that way that uh, you'd begin at that sort of level and then you'd progress through it and get more involved in such uh, secret projects i kind of got the impression that it, it wasn't for me it wasn't going anywhere because it, it was a little dark I mean, I saw through Scientology how how uh, things get funny with that in terms of controlling people. I mean, that's a very controlling uh, organization. 
and they're pretty much out just for the money and the control. So I, when I was watching them and involved with that, I see, I saw the potential of the darkness of of where that goes, and and any, and basically the. Scientology, the dinetics, the mind control part of it is CIA handbook, basically. It's just like how, how to interrogate people and how to uh, prevent or how to counter interrogation uh, methods, how to prevent being uh, taken over, you know. Uh, so it's through that, basically, the Scientology experience, I found that I didn't want to go any further with this. Uh, with what they were doing, because I saw the relationship with their intent and what was going on. In the beginning, the, it was, well, the secret spy programs have been going on forever, basically, since, since day one. And this OSS is just the beginning here. Of, uh, but who knows what was going on b before that? And in the beginning, it was just basically an elite club, you know, with socialites uh, taking the Ivy League uh, students out because they were all related to the Rockefellers and the Roosevelts and, and you know, the elite families and uh, also the lawyers. <laughs> the lawyers were one of the first uh, secret agents because they were the, uh, they were, they, because of their history and who they are. And so I, I just saw this, just like when I was uh, getting in teaching and I saw the politics, I, I kind of had the impression where it was going. So I, I got out of it uh, early, like, you know, early on. I didn't want to go any further. Back then in your youth, when you described yourself as a very physical type individual, um, what do you imagine then are are the qualities that these uh, agencies look for when they select their individuals. I mean, you would imagine that uh, they, those that they consider to be potentials for their operations at any level of it, there must be something in the individual that they see. So what quality do you think they saw in you that would be of service to them? Well, again, not that I'm the smart Ivy Leaguer, but it, my parents' connection uh, there was history with Elliot and my mother later on, and that that meeting, first meeting in the 40s, early 40s, that set it off to where my parents were involved in surveillance, and basically we kept in touch with Elliot and uh, throughout the years, and that's where he, through a handler, approached me. Uh, because of my connection with my mother and father. And it wasn't that I was necessarily capable or anything. It was just basically who you know. Because <laughs> there's a lot a lot brighter people out there and a lot of people, you know, that have better connections. But, but that one connection, it makes a whole, whole lot of difference. So he was able to... Um, because of his involvement too, he he was he was in you know through his connection with his father. By the way, he wrote a lot of books, and this particular one book about the private life of Eleanor and FDR, which got a lot of attention. But he was involved with a lot of meetings and secret meetings in, in Europe during World War II and after. And so we kept in touch. My parents were part of the. Uh, they moved to a relocation or uh, relocation camp after the war where they did surveillance on the U.S. soldiers there that were uh, big black market watches, chocolate, liquor, you know, because it was scarce in those days. So they were part of that. But basically, to answer your question, it was just a matter of connection, you know. And, and he thought of me and, and, you know, got in contact with me because in, I understand that in the early, the late 60s, that area, San Francisco Bay area where I was, um, it was uh, Haight-Ashbury 
uh, the rock bands, all that time, Free Love, uh, Make Love, Not War, Peace Activism, all that. There was a center there in San Francisco Bay Area, Stanford University with Joan Baez, and all, all the things going on. And later on, now there's Spaceship, Apple Spaceship, there's eBay, Facebook, Google. It's all that Silicon Valley area is, is uh, no accident I moved there because I was involved with that, all that, and the uh, surveillance. So he got in t touch with me, and um, that's where I uh, agreed to do the, the surveillance for those three groups, particularly. 